Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event this evening with Dantiel W. Moniz and Melissa Broder discussing milk blood heat and milk fed. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to the community during this time. We'll be, we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Our next event is this Thursday, March 4th, with Sarah Langan in conversation with Sarah Haskins discussing Good Neighbors. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter, which you can do on our website. To submit a question during the event, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like our speakers to answer, please click the Like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. Also support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button that reads Milk Blood Heat directly below the viewer screen. To buy Milk Fed, please click the link provided in the sidebar, which I'm gonna provide again. The links will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're selling digital audiobooks and eBooks through Libro.fm and Kobo for those who are interested. A little more about Dantiel. Dantiel is the recipient of the Alice Hoffman Prize for Fiction, the Cecilia Joyce Johnson Emergency, Emergency Emerging Writer Award for the Key West Literary Seminar and the Ten House Scholarship. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, Harper's Bazaar, Ten House, One Story, American Short Fiction, Plowshares, the Yale Review, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, and Us and Elsewhere. A little more about Melissa Broder. Melissa Broder is the author of the novels Milk Fed and The Pisces, um, and as well as the essay collection So Sad Today, five poetry collections, including Superdome, Super Doom, <laughs> Selected Poems, and Last Sex. Last, last Sex. She has <laughs> written for the New York Times, L.com, Vice, Vogue Italia, and New York Magazine's The Cut. Her poems appear in poetry, the Iowa Review, Guernica, Sense, and others. She is the winner of the Pushcart Prize for Poetry. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Dantiel and Melissa. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. So we're we're going to start with reading a little bit from our books. Um, we played rock paper scissors before, and I lost, so I have to go first. Um, so I'm going to go first. Um, I'm gonna read an excerpt from the story called The Hearts of Our Enemies. And I'm not gonna set you up, you can just flow with me, all right? The girls sat on the edge of the fountain. During school, kids called Margot and Marissa M&M, which they accepted without complaint, neither admitting the small relief and having even this dumb rationale for being constantly confused for the other. Marissa kept watch and Margot propped herself back on one arm, occasionally dipping her free hand into the cool, dirty water. The coins winked up at her through the slow ripple, silver and bronze and moss. At every lull and pedestrian, she sank her hand to the bottom, finger scrabbling against mildew slick tile and swiped up a handful of them. She kept only the quarters. The girls chatted while they fished. You and Drew make up yet? Forget him, I've moved on. And Margot had. She had realized early on that evidence of her own desirability was almost all she needed to be turned on. And when Drew had figured it out, She'd lost it to him earlier that year after they'd hit the one month mark. But she wasn't sentimental. She knew what they had was common and men had been looking at Margot since she was six years old so she could recognize it when she saw it. There was always someone else, sometimes someone better. Arm in arm, their pockets jangling, the girls strolled to the ice cream shop and bought two giant waffle cones, one blueberry cheesecake and the other strawberry. The parlor boy, the, the parlor boy Dull-eyed and monosyllabic, didn't comment on the wet change or its chlorine smell. He made minimum wage, gave free cones to his friends and girls he thought might date him. They weren't the first to exchange fountain money for goods and services. Marissa ate her cone guiltily, wolfing it down to make the evidence disappear, but Margot relished hers, eating with a spoon, letting the ice cream melt on her tongue. After her father had left, leaning over her bed to kiss her goodbye as if she were a child, Margot decided she would no longer feel sorry for anything. He coming back, Marissa had asked when Margot described the scene, probably. She didn't think they'd get divorced. That wasn't her father's style. He 
He liked to demonstrate, to make examples. Margot thought he was just punishing Frankie, not so much for the betrayal itself as for his own limited imagination that she could betray him. I hope he doesn't, she'd said, and at the time had meant it. She was punishing Frankie too, but not for what her mother thought. Margot didn't care about the local gossip. The word infidelity traded among the old neighbor ladies like it was foreign currency, like their own husbands hadn't been creeping around on them since just after, after the marriage certificate was signed, like they'd never thought about stepping out themselves. They gathered to pierce Frankie with their eyes whenever they could, another shame being the truest spectator sport, and wonder aloud how a woman getting so large in the middle could keep a first man, let alone catch a second. That poor child, they'd whispered loud enough for Margot to hear, living in a broken home. She didn't care about that either. Margot was mad because her mother had chickened out, hadn't actually slept with the other man, and because Frankie had told her husband about the little that had happened when no one would otherwise have known. Her mother had let herself be shamed, like a bad pet, her eyes cast down in response to the neighbor's satisfied viciousness, and now she followed after Margot constantly, ready to lick the floor beneath her feet. Despite her new vow, it was hardest not to feel sorry for Frankie, but Margot was getting better at it. After all, her mother had done this to herself. She remembered once when Frankie made them squid ink pasta during one of her wistful moods, going to five different markets for the ingredients, spending hours in the kitchen, steam curling her hair, the pots and pans heaped gluey in the sink. As they sat down to dinner, her father accepted his plate in silence, then made a comment he must have felt confident he could pass off his light. Wouldn't it have been easier to make a salad? Her mother had not replied, but left half her plate unfinished. Margot had been disgusted with her father and with Frankie for allowing it, disgusted with herself because she sometimes agreed with him. In all of this, Margot was mostly mad that her mother had wanted something and didn't take it, and the consequences were the same. Could this happen to her one day? Some man make her small inside her own body? Margot posed the question to Marissa, who remained tight-lipped on the subject of Frankie. They had made it a fast rule not to talk about each other's mothers, only listen. This mandate would serve them well, rewarding each girl with the other's loyalty long after their high school years. Margot finished her cone and Marissa said kindly and with knowing, enough moping. They browsed the stores, trying on outfits they knew they wouldn't buy, fingering the cheap fabrics with reverence for who they could become once wearing them. Margot left clothes in heaps in the corners of the dressing rooms, all off their hangers and twisted inside out. In one well-lit stall, she ignored the plastic sign that proclaimed all garments must be tried on over underwear and pulled on a teal leopard print thong. She strutted around the small space, a distance of two long-legged strides and just the underwear and a beauty pageant smile. She twirled in place until she thunked down, dizzy among the crocheted halters, denim cutoffs and hippie skirts like white wilted flowers. She was of that special age where she knew both nothing and everything. And no matter where or at whom she looked, she saw her own reflection glimmering back like a skim of oil. She could be anyone, still. Margot pressed the fabric hard between her legs so that some of herself remained, then peeled the underwear off and dressed, and once outside threw them back into the plastic bin with the rest of the animal skins, the tigers, the giraffes, the diamond-backed boas. She bought a bracelet that resembled a slinky and a dollar lip gloss and a small clear tube, cupcake it was called, and went on wet and pink. At the food court, Margot stuffed herself so that later that night, the two of them alone, she could push her mother's meal around the plate. Okay, I'm gonna do, wait, hold on, my dog is shifting. All right, um, all right, pickle in or out? Okay, um, he's sorry, he just had to make a decision. Um, so, I, <laughs> um, so I am going to prep uh, you uh, I'll just tell you like a tiny bit. Um, so, um, sorry, I just got a text. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> so this is, um, so the protagonist of my book is Rachel and she's like our lady of um, disordered eating. And she goes to the same yogurt shop every day uh, for lunch and she really loves the counter boy there because he doesn't peer pressure her or ask her any questions about her yogurt. He, uh, like the sub, the sandwich artist at Subway is very inquisitive, very interested. And this, uh, this man, Adiv, a young Orthodox Jewish man, leaves her alone. Uh, one day she goes in, uh, Adiv is no longer there and Adiv is replaced with his sister Miriam, who is a Zoftig kosher coquette 
and starts peer pressuring Rachel into um, having more yogurt, more toppings. Um, Rachel, there's various yogurt surgeries that go on. One day Rachel returns to Yogurt and Adiv is back and she is relieved to have her yogurt scooper there. So um, this is that. A great miracle occurred. Adiv returned. Shalom, I called out when I saw him behind the counter. Shalom, he said, looking confused. Never, I was sure, had any customer been so happy to see Adiv back at it. This was my burning bush, my Noah and the ark and the dove. I was to be captain of my dessert realm again. No more peer pressured extras or yogurt in conversation. I wondered how his experience in Israel had been, what his views were. But a food service interaction seemed an inopportune time to say, hey, any thoughts on a two-state solution? I'll have the cheesecake, I said, omitting any discourse on land disputes. Then Miriam emerged from the back. Hey, Rachel, she said, signaling that she'd handle me. Oh, hi, I said. Be useful and go unbox, unbox the pretzel cones, she said to Adiv. Adiv complied. I watched her grab a 16 ounce cup and pull the lever on the machine. The yogurt began its ascent, swirling upward until it overtook the brim, entering the unsafe space above it. But then it transcended that realm, soaring to a new unthinkable altitude before reaching a summit that was miles above where she began. Even for Miriam's style, that serving was absurd. I want to give you a free topping, she said, because you didn't like your last yogurt. She like busted her, like decapitating the yogurt in the dumpster. That's okay, I said, I don't want one. Come on, she said, there has to be something you like. What about sprinkles? I'm just gonna put some sprinkles on it, just a little. Rainbow, I said instinctively, then thought, fuck. I watched her spooning on the sprinkles and noticed for the first time that she had lovely fingernails, smooth and egg-shaped, trimmed neatly. She wasn't a biter like me, a compulsive habit that began in childhood as something of a snack. Now I painted my nails red as a deterrent, but I only ended up biting off the polish too, spitting flakes of crimson. When she handed me the yogurt, every inch of that mammoth peak was covered in rainbow sprinkles. It was gorgeous, seamless, as though the yogurt were a rainbow itself, no separation between dessert and topping. Its beauty made me think for a moment that it should have always been this way. I stared at the sculptural masterpiece in my hand. I wanted to kiss it, to make out with it, to touch it with my tongue and lips and explore what those tiny textures felt like. Simply holding the cup, I was rocketed back to Sprinkle's past. I remembered that they were actually made of tiny bits of dried frosting and the way you could dissolve them in your mouth, suck until they sof softened back to frosting once again completing one of life's great cycles of transformation. See, said Miriam, everyone loves a topping. I smiled at her and felt weak. Then, as though compelled by an otherworldly force, I brought that majestic mountain to my mouth, licked it, and took a bite. Mmm, I said with my mouth full, thanks. I closed my eyes. The sprinkles were so delicious, melting there on my tongue, that my throat began to call out for them. What would be the harm? What would be the harm, said my throat. What would be so bad about just swallowing? Of course, I knew what the harm would be. Sprinkles were loaded with sugar and there was no way of knowing how many of them were packed into any given mouthful. From one bite to the next, it would be impossible to calculate a caloric load. Panicking, I spun on my heel and headed for the door. I hoped that I could keep the concoction in my mouth long enough without swallowing to get to the trash can on the curb. But when I reached the can, my lips would not open to relinquish the mouthful. I stood there and swallowed it down my gullet. Then, to my horror, I found myself sticking my tongue into a crevice between yogurt and cup, where a small pile of naked sprinkles had fallen. I licked them out. I didn't stop, but pressed on to where the sprinkles and some drips of melted yogurt had formed a viscous union. I chewed these bites up quickly and swallowed again and again, as though this were the fastest way to get rid of them. While I ate, I watched myself, like I was hovering up above, split into two beings. One of me was the me doing the eating. The other observed myself in shock as I continued to devour it all. Stop, stop, called out the observer me, but it was no use. 
I was consumed by the yogurt, all five senses bathing in its drips and swirls, as though I had entered some yogurt door. No thought, no vision or sound, but the yogurt and its sprinkles. Any fear or hesitation fully eclipsed by sensation, the crunch, the slurp, the melt, the heavenly feeling of cleaning each side evenly with my tongue, hardness and softness, sweetness and more sweetness, a prism of beauty on earth and above it, and me, the me on the ground, nothing but a giant mouth and tongue, eating and eating for nothing, not one thing except sheer pleasure alone. I don't know how long I stood there in front of the trash can, devouring, licking, swallowing. I only knew that when my mind and body were finally united again, the first thing I noticed was the sour smell of trash in the warm sun. I felt afraid, then a hot shame. It had really happened. I'd eaten the whole thing. All that remained was a dribble at the bottom with two sprinkles floating in it, one pink and one blue. I dug them out with my spoon and put that last little bite in my mouth. Something had taken me over, possessed me, some phantom transmitted from Miriam to me or a demon lurking latent all these years, now suddenly awakened. I had not lost control like that with food since I was 16. I thought the demon was dead. No, that wasn't true. I had sensed the demon in me all along, waiting for the right moment to open my mouth, suck the world down my throat. All of my restriction, my efforts at control, as I tiptoed daily around the edge of hunger, were enacted in the name of keeping that demon shut up. Sleep late to delay calories, write everything down, eat ice, avoid friends. But in all that busy work, I'd forgotten what made the demon space so dangerous in the first place. When you were in it, it felt fucking great. Okay. So let's get into it. Um, yeah. Um, so where should we start? We kind of, we, we came up with like a, we saw a lot of overlaps between our yeah. Our books are in conversation in so many ways. If you're thinking about food and the conflation of love and harm and like performance and all this stuff. But I think because we both read like food sections, let's talk about food is love or like food is harm or nourishment. Yeah. Um, Should we start with the milk? Yeah. Let's start with milk. And first of all, just a little side note. Um, when my book was coming out and starting to get announced and all this stuff, I just, there were like people, they would just be like, oh, another milk titled book, or oh, look at these authors doing all this milk. I guess milk is trending or whatever. And it was like, okay, it's not like we got together and was like, hey, you want to write about dairy? You know what I mean? That's not, that's not what happened. But yeah, let's, let's talk about milk. Yeah. Milk, I'm like, milk is old. Milk is archetypal. Like we didn't invent milk. Yeah. And I think for me, in terms of milk, it, it has more to do with connection, right? It's it's how you are fed from your from your mother or your, your caregiver or whatever. But like milk is what you drink when you're young. That's the thing that nourishes your body, that grows your body. It's the connection you have with whomever it is that's taking care of you. And so that's kind of what I was aiming for and in, invoking the elemental nature of milk throughout these stories, that connection, that inheritance. Yeah, I mean, you have a line in your book. Sorry, I just like heard something. Um, you have a line in your book in the, I think it was the Almanac of Bones story mm -hmm. where, um, I mean, the milk appears in there, I think twice, because there's that first revelation that the speaker has. So um, I don't want to describe your story, but I'll just give like, so in an Almanac of Bones, um, there's a woman with, I don't know if I, I wouldn't necessarily say an absent mother, but definitely a mother, who, a mother who is very much her own person and like, mm -hmm motherhood maybe isn't her first priority. Yeah. Um, and so, and there's a really beautiful moon ritual that takes place in that story where the speaker is with her grandmother and, um, and her grandmother's like crew, this like posse of women, which is so beautiful. And um, she has this moment where she realized like there's this chain of mothers, right? Where she sees like the, the milk, like, passed on from generation to generation, this sort of like lineage, right? That was really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and then also, and then there's a moment towards the end of the story where she's talking to her own mother and her mother has a glass of milk and her mother offers it to her. And she's yeah. like, well, isn't this what mothers are supposed to do? So I don't know. What mothers do, bring milk to their unsleeping children. Yeah, I think, exactly. I think it, you know, it's a moment in which that narrator kind of realizes that 
you're my mother, but you're also your own person. And I think it's really easy to look at, especially parents, right? To see them as just that role, just that title, when it's like they are people who have come to the earth the, for the first time, just like you. And they're, you know, it's their first time here and they're learning all of that stuff. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think our parents are our first gods, um, right? Like they give us the liturgy of like pleasure and like, like, um, they're our first gods. And so it is, but I, th I thought that was so beautiful that, because it's like, it is always interesting to that. I think like in the reckoning with the fact that like a parent isn't a God, right? Like that they have a, mo like your mother has a mother and your mother had, and her mother had a mother. And it's like a lot of the shit that's handed down and the good stuff that's yes. handed down. The intergener, like it, I, that's another question. I think I'm always kind of getting after is like, what do we inherit? And it's not this the tangible stuff. It's not like possessions, right? But it's like mind states and moods and viewpoints of the world. Like, what are we inheriting? But I, I think it's really interesting that you talk about parents as first gods, right? Because you have that line in your book where, you know, the narrator's kind of thinking about her own mom and like, you know, the godmother, the perfect mother. And I also have a line too that, and you know, it's like, oh, in, in the uh, story that I read from, she says, or the mother is like kind of reflecting about the way it used to be with her daughter when she was young, she's like, oh, she revered me as a mother God. And I think a lot of the first um, tensions that happen between us and our parents is like when we get to that age when we realize like, oh, I don't agree with everything that you've said, or oh, I realize now that you're not always right and you don't know everything. And that there becomes this resistance to, I guess what your parents are, even if you're not really fully understanding who your parents are as people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's weird when, like, I know I've had this experience and I wanted to look at it a lot in Milk Fed of like, there are things that I thought, like, I, I really wanted to look at the nature of like truth and certitude. Um, and I actually found a lot of that in Milk Blood Heat regarding like the certitude of religion, right? Like the yeah. certitude of Jehovah or, um, and the Baptist culture. But, um, you know, there are these things that I feel like we, we, take on as religion that it like aren't even necessarily like theological, right? But we make them religion. And um, the first, I think like part of separating from the mother or like maybe like deconditioning from that religion is like when you start to see that like, oh my God, all these things I thought were truth were actually stories. Like these were just opinions. <laughs> Yeah, I thought this is how the world exactly. was. Exactly. And then there's a deeper part of that is not even just realizing that they're stories, but realizing that truth is subjective because it's dependent on whoever's experiencing it. It's all in perspective. And so someone's truth over here is going to be different from someone's truth over here. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's the whole kind of like the world is flipping upside down in, in these really interesting ways. But I, I'm really interested because you... So there's, so Miriam in the story, right? She's kind of like this, it, it's really funny because the, the narrator is thinking of her as like this golem that she, she might've created accidentally. And, you know, mm -hmm. she's kind of forcing her to, to face herself in a lot of ways, but there's, you know, they go, they're getting ready to go to the golden dragon or they're in the golden dragon. And Miriam's like, oh, well, you know, she's asked her if she basically, if she believes in God, right? And she's like, eh, I mean, he doesn't text me, which is which is a very like you line. Like I'm, I'm really glad that you put that line in there about he doesn't text me. But then, you know, Miriam looks around and she's like, well, all of this is God. And she's talking about the golden dragon and like the drinks, the alcohol, all of that stuff. And so I think another way in which our books are really in conversation with each other is like, what is the nature of God? And is it different than what we've been told? Which I think, yes, but like, yeah, what do, what do you think? Well, um definitely i mean i think like you know for me like just to go back to the milk like i see that like that nurture like i feel like we live in this like if there's a we're kind of well at least my experience of the world is like there's there's a lot of like pressure to like love oneself like whatever that means and like kind of but in this way that's very like you're gonna buy it or you're gonna like arrive whole right and like i sort of see the milk as like the nurture we like the, the idea of self-love, right? Like the nurture that we can give to ourselves, but that um, it's not like there's like this arrival, like there's not this like land of milk and honey, right? Like for me, like God is like a daily reprieve, like yeah. self-love is daily, right? It's not like you buy the ticket at Goop and then like you eat the like whatever kale, 
salad and like use the right like aluminum free deodorant, you know. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you about um, regarding like, so there's your your story. Um, um, is it off the raft outside the raft? Yeah. yeah. So that's a story where your um, your speaker, your your narrator is um, kind of struggling with like the conception of of God, right? Like the God that she has been given. And um, without giving anything away, can you talk a little bit about the ending of that story? Yeah. I don't know, you really have to give something away, but. No, yeah. Um, that's actually probably one of my favorite endings in the book. I, I just really love like the last line of it. Um, but so yeah, this is a narrator who, you know, her, she has, you know, both her parents, they're not married, they never were, so it's not, not like a thing for her, but like her cousin, who she's very close with, is her best friend, lives with their grandmother because of this crime that her parents committed, right? And during the course of the story, she's with her grandmother, who is like just strict Jehovah's Witness, and like, you know, we have to do Bible study, we have to do all of these things, and she's starting to have a moment where she's questioning, well, is he even real? Like, what does that mean? Is he just something that, a story we're told, so we'll behave? And, you know, so there's this moment that happens where she and her cousin go to the beach and they jump out of the raft and she kind of has this reckoning with what God actually is. And it's something where it's not like this white man that lives in the sky for her now. It's like, oh, it's these waves. It's 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 essentially nature is what is what she comes to understand it as. And so I don't know. I think I'm just always interested in like the God that we set up for various reasons, like humans set up and the God that is literally all around us that we're like kind of neglecting and destroying, not kind of, we're, we're doing it, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? It's like, she's not sure if she believes. And then in that moment, like it's like that foxhole moment, like she believes, right? But it's like when she needs God, she like, she believes like the way that, like that Tennessee Williams quote, like some, I think it's like, sometimes there's God so quickly, but it's like not the God of like, you know, it's not the God that she's been like grappling with. It's this yeah. totally other conception. And it's not even a God that she has even thought to ask for help really. It was like, you know, it's just like, okay, I'm acknowledging the existence of something that's more powerful than me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that humility. Yeah. Like facing your own death. That's always a moment, right? When you're like, oh, I could die. Yes. Or, you know, mortality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I really, I really also liked that a lot of your stories, um, you know, are, they're, they're set, a lot of them are set in adolescence, um, which I mean, to me was like, I'm still scarred. Um, <laughs> no, like, I feel like I kind of stopped at age 13 a little bit. Um, like my, you know, they say like your bat mitzvah is when you like become a woman and I'm just like, well, you know, I just sort of like stayed there. Um, but, um, you know, and, and also like the importance of, or just like the integral nature of some of those like female, like those, those female friendships and relationships at those ages. Um, and will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I actually was, so it reminded me of a moment in your book, even though, you know, they're not teenage girls or adolescent girls. It reminded me of that moment where she's with Anna in the in the office and it's like the them versus the us-ness of it. There's a way in which, you know, female friendships can be so tender and intense and like, again, like the division between you and that person just completely evaporates. But then there's also this kind of like, sometimes like this, us being together, us having this closeness is definitely at the expense of someone else. Yeah. It's like the most exclusive club ever and, and you're in it or you're outside of it. I don't know, but yeah, so I feel like girlhood is so interesting to me. Obviously I had one, but it's interesting to me because I think it's one of those situations where duality is at play in such an obvious way, right? You get from a very young age, if you're a girl, like this is how you need to behave. And then, you know, you become responsible for other people's perceptions of you very early. It's like, what did you do to like make this thing happen to you, this terrible <laughs> thing? And it's like, you know, the pink fluffiness, the frivolousness of girlhood that I so often got in the 90s growing up. I don't think that's really real. I mean, it, girlhood is like dark. 
I mean, like, you know, you got the, you know, you're responsible for a man who might want to like kidnap you and take you away somewhere. And then like, you start growing boobs, and you don't know what to do with that and you're bleeding. And it's like this, this very dark, intense period that like very few people will talk about honestly. And I, you know what I mean? I just wanted to capture some of that onto the page too. Yeah, I mean that powerlessness, right? Like, first of all, your parents are the boss of you, which sucks. I mean, like, even no matter how good your parent, somebody today was just telling me they're like they were looking at these kids. I was at the park, and they were like, "Oh, I always wish I had grown. I live in California." They're like, "I always wish I had grown up in California." I'm like, "Yeah, but you're still not in charge of your own life. Like, you still have these, parents. you know, like your your time is not your own." So there's like that powerlessness. Then there's like the powerlessness over the body, right? Um, and you and there's very limited resources in terms of like, like I just remember like really like cobbling together like I feel like that's when too it's such an it's such a um I don't know it's such like a ripe age for like um sort of our mental like the way we think about life because it's like you start to cobble together these like non-solution solutions or um and um it's sort of like you just kind of you have to be scrappy like you sort of make do with, yeah. with what you have right I like mean, I, yeah. yeah i think that's really interesting too when you bring up like protection right because it is it's your parents who are supposed to protect you and often time i mean i want to say often times but like sometimes you know they're not actually protecting you in the ways that you actually need to be protected and whether that's protection through honesty or protection through like allowing you to like kind of come into personhood, which is, you know, I, which is probably hard for parents. I, I'm not a parent, so I, I don't know, but I, I am a daughter and I know that my mom had a really hard time with allowing me to come into personhood. And it, and it goes back to me saying that, you know, we started really bumping heads about the time I turned 14 because it was like, oh, you know, I, I'm trying to untether myself from my childhood and this constraint. I don't know what I'm doing. I definitely needed guidance and I still needed that. But there's like this whole war between, well, you're not letting me do what I need to do or what I feel like I need to do. And we have no communication between us. The communication has somehow broken down between my wants and your wants. And like now we have this struggle. So, yeah, it's just interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine, I don't have kids either, thank God, but like, I can imagine, I, I have enough trouble with a 12 pound dog. He's like, r rules with an iron paw around here. But, um, you know, I can imagine that you like carry this baby around and then like this little like, this little pisher is just like telling you that it's a grown up, you know, and it's like, you're just like, settle down, you know, like you're so young. Like, when it's, 12, 13, yeah. 13. I mean, it's so wild when you, like, when I look at people who were the age I was when I thought I was grown, I'm like, oh God, baby, do you know what I mean? And, and it keeps like, it keeps moving forward. I imagine this is going to be the rest of my life now. But like, even when I see people who are like 25, 26, I'm like, you, you're so young. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm not that much older than that, but still, it just feels like, but I'm especially I'm thinking like 18 when I really was like, I'm a grown up now. I'm 18. I'm legal. And I was like, oh, you have no idea. You have yeah. No idea. yeah. Yeah. It's like they let you behind the wheel of a car. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. a lot of things where I'm in retrospect. I'm like, hmm, it's like, not a great idea. Not a great yeah. Idea. No, they look younger the older you get for sure. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and I think that there's like, um, you know, at the same time, there is something about youth where it's like, I don't know, like, I, 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 I kind of, I always feel like it's like, I'm like, oh, you don't know shit. Like college kids, I know you, you teach, but do you teach an MFA or do you teach undergrad? I'm teaching an MFA, but I'm teaching undergrads and graduates. Okay. Yeah. So like whenever, cause like college kids are an, in, that's an interesting time, right? Cause it's like, you think you know, and you're like free for the first, like they think they yeah. know. And I'm always like, oh, they don't know shit. But you know, like I was like, yeah, but there's something about, I think like the, the knowledge of childhood, right? Like that knowing that like unfettered yeah. knowing where it's like, you do know. And like, I kind of, I feel like I saw that a lot. I saw that a lot in your, um, in the title story in your book, um, where the two girls are, 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 they're like talking about death all the time. And in some ways it is for like that shock, but you know, or like to get high, I guess, you know, right. Cause it's like that boredom of that. It's just like, there's nothing else. But, yeah. um, but in some ways they're like addressing and especially juxtaposed with the, the mother in that story who is like very performative, right? Like, you know, the smile and 
So oh yeah, you- I mean, she's definitely like not showing her cards. Yeah, but which which is a way in which we often have black women acting in in public situations anyway. So like, you know what I mean? It's kind of like a second face that you just slide on to go interact with white people <laughs> or like, you know what I mean? Like, so. Can you talk more about that actually? Yeah, I mean, about what, like about the mother or? Yeah, like that, the, the mother's use of that. Yeah, so I mean, so I grew up with, I had a lot of like, I went to mostly white schools and that kind of thing. So I had a lot of white friends and, you know, my mom was you know, perfectly polite, but there would be certain things. I mean, they're just certain things that like don't translate. Like I remember going to my friend's house in middle school and she like said something really rude to her mom where she was just like, no mom, I don't want that. And just the way that she did it, I was like, Oh my God. I was like, you, you're going to get slapped. You know what I mean? Like, and so they're just, a, just those moments of that. So I think that the mother has this kind of wall up because you have to have that a lot of the times in, in a world where, you know, patriarchy and white supremacy are the systems that we live in. But I think that also some of that wall that she has is an understanding that that's what's necessary to survive. And she's, so in that story, you know, the daughter feels as if she's not understood by her mother and she kind of wishes that her friend's mother, who is white, that was her mother, because it seems like she has more freedoms. It seems like, you know, she's allowed to kind of be sad if she feels sad or, you know, whatever it is. But the mother, her mother actually understands her very well and sees her. And what she's trying to instill in her is like some sort of protection, even if it doesn't feel like protection or love to the daughter. Right. And that's another thing that I'm that I'm kind of exploring is like the conflation of love and harm. Right. There's a lot of the times that what we think is love is not love at all or what we think is harm is actually love. And in that case, in that story, it's the mother being like, hey, I see you and I'm trying to protect you. But this is the way that I know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's also like another thing that can come full circle too. like we talked about sort of the like the real the recognition that like our parents are human, that they are Mm -hmm. that they are right, that they are not gods, that like what they've instilled is. um not always necessarily like the gospel. If that, if if like the truth, if the if there isn't, you know, if there right, is, if there's no capital T truth. It's like yeah, little, little T truths. You know, everywhere, everyone has their little T truth. Yeah, and like, but it's it's been really interesting for me lately. And this is going to sound like kind of heavy, and it's like not really about my book, but um, so I've been like, um, I told Don Teal, like I've been, um, my dad has been in the ICU for like, um, 11 weeks, like in and out of the ICU. He's back in the ICU now. And, um, and I was very convinced, like my mom, one of her like characteristics, very similar to my, the mom in the book, um, is in milk fed is, um, sort of like a controlling nature and like a forward March and also like a denial, right? Like a mm-hmm. denial of anything human or weakness or feeling. Um, so sort of a robotic, and I was like very much, I felt that with her and the, and my dad, like I really felt that it was that we should, um, you know, take my dad off this ventilator and like let him go to sleep. And um, I didn't want her denial to cause like harm, right, to him. Um, and then lo and behold, a few weeks later, my dad was became responsive again. He was talking to my sister and I, he in no way indicated that he wanted to die. And I was, it was so interesting. Cause I was like, wow, these things about my mother that like I thought were, that I have experienced as harmful and that I thought were being so harmful. I'm like, shit, dude, like I was going to pull the plug, you know, like I was like more team pull the plug. Cause I felt like I had to be cause my mom. But so I also think it's interesting, like in terms of seeing our parents as people too, there's that humility of like, I don't know. It's just like, it's never fucking ending. You know, like I'm like, just when I yeah. thought, yeah, yeah. I was like, Oh, like those characteristics actually like worked in this situation. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important, especially if you have like a difficult, you know, relationship with your parent is to think about, it's not saying it's not excusing it or permissing the behavior in any way. You know what I mean? If you have to set up boundaries to have a healthy relationship with that person or not have a relationship with that person, that's fine. But I think it is, it was good for me anyway, to think about behaviors and think about, well, those were, you know, evolved for my parents so that they could move through the world and survive through the world. And so like thinking about it that way made me have like a very, I don't know, a deeper understanding of like who my parents are as like people, which I know it it sounds so simple to say that, but it's really not like, you know what I mean? Some people I think maybe never have that revelation that their parents are people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. 
Yeah. No, that question of boundaries is really interesting. I mean, that was definitely something in milk fed. I mean, I love a 90 day detox. I think in the Pisces, there was also like a 90 day, no contact. And I'm like, okay, like no more books with 90 day. Like you know, what's, what's the magic of the three months? I don't know. I, you know, three months. Well, so someone actually just asked me that. Um, cause I'm working on this. I'm writing. I just wrote this TV pilot for milk fed, which it's, it was fun. Cause it was sort of like writing fanfic of my own characters. Like they have to do different stuff. And they were like, so can you, so I got these studio notes and they were like, so can you make it a little more clear? Like why 90 days? And so what I, I don't know. I just, that's what I've always been taught in my like many like attempts at like self-preservation. But I had the therapist said, 90 days is long enough to um, really get clear. It's mm -hmm. like 90 days is long enough to really get clear on, and really be separate. Um, which, you know, then you then you go back to your- From from habitual behavior? Yeah, like, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's enough time, I guess, on like a cellular level too. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, but um, you know, but 90 days has always been like a magic number. But it is interesting, like the boundary, like, I don't know, just the question of the setting of boundaries and like the, um, how do you navigate that, right? Like how do you navigate, cause yeah. there's love in there. And like the things we've been taught that we have to unlearn, there's also, they were taught with like love ostensibly. So it's like, it's painful to like. Yeah, I think that's, I mean like, I'm still working on setting up any kind of boundaries and like, you know, like any, any 90 days for me, I'll be like the first 10, 15 days. I'm like, yes. And then the, you know, the second I miss that 16th day, then I'm like, Oh, well you fucked up. Now you can't do it anymore. So back to zero. It's, it's a weird thing, but yeah, I think navigating boundaries is something that's difficult, but it's like, you got to figure it's like the same thing as with, um, you don't arrive at a place of like, now my boundaries are just set. It's like, you know, it's all journey, no destination kind of a deal. Um, I feel like, okay, so we're at like 15 minutes. So like- Should we look at some questions? Yeah, if y'all have questions, there's one question in there. Please ask us some questions or like, you know, just ask us some questions. <laughs> there's one in there. We can look at, we can look at that. And if no one has questions for us, we can keep talking. We have things. Oh, it's not a question. It's just a note. I really appreciate the way you both, uh, the way both of your writing examine shame. Oh. I mean, we could we could turn that into a question. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. You go first. You talk about shame. Um. Well, I guess like it's one of my oldest relationships is my relationship with shame, and um, I think that. All right. Let me put it this way. I enjoy writing. Um, or I enjoy sharing parts of myself that um, that I've I've kept secret um, in the set, or that I've like that I feel shameful about, or and I enjoy exploring sort of underbellies. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and that just reminded me of something else I wanted to ask you. But um, I, but um, I enjoy exploring underbellies. It's kind of like if I have a zit and I like walk into a party, I'll like point out the zit so that everyone knows like i know that i have yeah. the zit. It's a way of like I, yeah, yeah that like you don't need to look at me and like oh no she has a giant i'm like look yeah it's right here yeah right here. it's a control thing right it's like yeah. i saw it before you did and i feel like that's sort of my approach to writing it's like i'm gonna control the narrative of like my darkest shit um you know it, it it's like a a confessional it's a confessional desire i guess you call it confessional desire but mm -hmm. um but it's not in an attempt to shock so much as to like we're as sick as our secrets kind of a thing you know yeah it's more confession and not it's just like getting it in the light yeah yeah which you saying that made me think of so i have a story um it's thicker than water and that is navigating all of this shame it's shame of like our past shame of what we've refused to acknowledge but also shame of the body which i think women get that just like all the time anyway just our like normal bodies even if you just stepped out of the shower but i think like also what where i feel like i wasn't allowed to be like sweaty or dirty or messy or any kind of thing like that and so it was like a shame of like my body's normal smells you know what i mean and like yeah. having to navigate that especially as a younger person but yeah i feel like for me I'm always interested in 
talking, I want to talk about the stuff we don't want to talk about because in talking about it, it makes it where it's like, it's okay. It's a really human thing. Any of it, whatever it is, any kind of um, implied darkness or any of that stuff, I want to talk about it. And it's uncomfortable, but I think sometimes we have to be uncomfortable to acknowledge like stuff about ourselves. And well, you, had a, you had a really cool quote in that story. Um, it was, I actually like wrote it down. The blood of the covenant is thicker oh, yeah. than the water of the womb. So like, will you talk about that a little? Yeah, so that so that story in particular um, is kind of it's these two estranged siblings and they're going on a road trip to go lay their father's ashes to rest, you know, so there's this all this tension between them. They haven't spoken in a, basically a year and the sister so wants to rekindle her relationship with her brother. But like, you know, the brothers kind of moved on and made peace with his life because of his family's inability to acknowledge certain things that happened in their family. Right. And so, you know, he has this girlfriend that he brings along the trip that she didn't know it was a complete surprise. And, you know, the, you know, the, so the common phrase that we hear all the time is blood is thicker than water, right? Meaning your family over all else. But then this girlfriend kind of steps in and she's like, well, it's a misquote, which, you know, so the way that she says it, which is the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb has the opposite connotation. And so just, just, I don't know, I think language is so interesting and in how we kind of skew it to, you know, say what we want it to mean. And then like, there's all these different like reference points for it. But I think family is something really interesting to me, like both born family and found family. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh, people are asking us questions now. Let's see what we have. Um, I did like how the, they were carrying around the ashes, the whole, I was like, it's very like Faulknerian, but like female. Yeah. That story. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Milk fed feels like such a California story in certain ways and milk blood heat so steeped in Florida. How do you both think about the, Oh, I'm so terrible at pronunciation. Evocation of place as related to what most feeds nourishes your writing. It's a really good question. That's from, Oh, it's from Meredith. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, she knows. Wait, hold on. One second. Um, I got unplugged. No, you're good. Oh, I'm unplugged. Oh. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah, you. Um, um, yeah, you go first. Um, let me close this really quick. Yeah, so for me, I would say that I'm really bad at writing place mostly. I'm not, I'm like better, I'm better than I wanna give myself credit for, but um, you know, cause for me, the internal space of a character is like a setting to me or that's why I write it as a setting. But for Florida in general, it's really cliche to say it, but it is like a sec, it's like a, another character in the book. It's just a very visceral place. If you've ever been to Florida, it's not just that it's hot here, it's also humid here, which is like a way of like encasing you. It's just like so present all the time. But I also wanted to write about my home because my home is, so memeable and so like, you know what I mean? Like people are like, oh, Florida and all this stuff. And I wanted to write about my home in a play in a way that didn't contribute to stereotypes. And like there are stories here too, beyond California and beyond New York and beyond all the places that get written about all the time. And so I wanted to honor that. What about you? So I don't like writing place either. Okay, so like, um, Oh, I, there was this quote I heard. I think it was like Walter Mosley. Someone asked him like, what should I leave out of a story? And he was like, leave out the parts that people skip. And I always think of place. I mean, I love delicious writing about place when it's good, but I don't know that that's like my forte, but yes. I also, and like writing in scene is like so challenging for me because I like live in my mind. I don't really actually live on the planet a lot of the time. Yeah, so like writing, Oh, sorry, I just turned off my light. Okay, now it's gonna be in the dark. Anyway, um, so, oh wait, here, hold on. Uh, so writing, how about that? Um, so writing, um, yeah, so that's how I feel. So writing and scene. I, also, because I think the other challenge for me is action. And I think that because I um, come from a poetry background, um, in, po in a poem, like not, like that, like not all that much stuff has to happen. Like the turn can be totally internal, um, yeah. but um, but in like prose, so much has to happen. And then now, like in screenwriting, which I've been doing a little of, like so much has to happen. I'm just like, I can't believe more shit has to happen. Um, but I will say that geography has had a major effect on my writing. Like I used to live in New York, and I used to write poems on the subway. And then when I moved to LA, I started dictating in my car because I couldn't type 
poems in the car because like right. I couldn't like on the 405. And so um that really influenced like the way that I um my line breaks disappeared and my language became more conversational and I started to um, write prose. So LA actually really, or, you know, living in a car culture as opposed to a subway culture. Um, I don't, I don't know if I would have started writing prose if I had stayed in New York, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe okay, I'm going to fix my light. Should we look at another question? Yeah. So this one is to you specifically. So you're going to be okay. back. Um, so uh, this here is directed specifically to Melissa, as I was totally enraptured by the intimacy and milk fed. Any favorite erotic fiction? Oh my God, are you kidding? <laughs> so much. Oh, well, um, let me take you to my bookshelf. Yeah. Let's have a look. So faves. Okay, so, um, well, I love Marguerite de Ross. Um, and I would say my faves by Marguerite de Ross. And she's like more love than like physical arrows, but she, I love what she does with like negative capability and white space. I'd say blue eyes, black hair, the ravishing of, of Lowell Stein, um, and the malady of death are probably my favorites of hers. Um, I've been reading this writer lately who I love this French writer, um, this is a book, Crazy for Vincent, Hervé Guibert, very hot. Um, and now I'm reading something else of his. I mean, there's so many, there's so many. A um, Hundred Boyfriends just came out, fucking so hot. Brontes is like the best writer. All of Brontes' stuff is the best. And then there's like subtle, like adolescent longing, like Tarje Vestas, The Ice Palace. I mean, basically, so I love books of longing. Um, oh, and I'm like looking at problems, Jade Charm. I mean, there's so much, there's so much. I'm an avid reader. What I will say though, is that if you go to my Goodreads, most of the books I like usually like are books with air. Like there's usually either like, there's usually magic, humor, sex, preferably three out of three, sometimes two out of three never less than one out of three. Oh, and Paul takes the form of a mortal girl. I mean, there's just, go to my Goodreads or you can listen to my, um, I have this like podcast, uh, Eating Alone in My Car. I don't promote it, but it just exists. And I, I talk about books on there, like most, like most episodes of what I'm reading. But go to my Goodreads and anything I gave five stars to probably is pretty filthy. What about you? I, I, can, I don't have titles off the top of my head, but I do like good sex and books, so like, I'm, I'm taking notes on, on, on your stack. I'll send you a list. Yeah, yeah. no. Send me, email me. Marguerite de Ross was like, definitely. Oh, and then I'm, I'm just like looking at my shelf. Tampa. I mean, there's so much, but um, Marguerite was definitely like a find. Like I, I kind of got into her like a year and a half ago. And um, I've also been reading a lot of Colette, which isn't like super filth, but um, like the pure and the impure and um, is beautiful writing about sex and love. And also um, there was another one that I loved. Uh, Cherie. Cherie is like really beautiful. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. There's like so much, you know, Gertrude Stein lifting belly. Yeah. Is, like, the hottest poem. I mean, you know, there's like, uh, I think we have time for one more. Um, and so this one, Oh, this is a good one to wrap it up on. Were there any books that were formative to your development as a writer? Um, I was the type of kid who my writing was not regulated when I was, a, you know, it was like, you know, my mom like watched over what I was watching, like film and TV, but it was like books were free, free game. It was like, you know, I could just read anything. And so I remember like, I mean, I read a lot of E.C. Andrews, which makes sense to me when I think about like what I like to write about, like just all the flowers in the attic. And then like, you know, all these <laughs> like- Seeds of yesterday. Than that. Yeah, there's a lot of sex and shame. There. And shame, sex and shame. Um, but um, I read a lot of, I read anything. Like I remember my stepmom had a copy of how Stella got her groove back and I like snuck it away and like read it and didn't understand a lot of it. But like, I understood that, you know, that I wasn't supposed to be reading it. And I, I love that. I feel like that all contributed to my sense of style and purpose. What about you? 
Okay, well, I love V.C. Andrews, and I also really love Terry McMillan, too. Um, but I did not read Terry McMillan when I was young. I did read uh, V.C. Andrews when I was young. I would say, okay, so um, probably as a poet, I'd say, like, Mary Rufel and mm -hmm. C.A. Con. There's a book by C.A. Conrad called A Beautiful Marsupial Afternoon that I just pulled out the other day, and it's, like, this really amazing book of writing exercises and that was definitely like impactful not when I was super young but but I will say that the book and that probably had like the most influence in terms of like writing milk fed would probably have to be like um like I guess like this trio of uh Philip Roth books like um Sabbath Theater um Port Noise Complaint and Goodbye Columbus like when I read Goodbye Columbus when I was 11 or 10 or whatever and I saw him talk about like that there are these like mayonnaise Jews that are like his family. It's like this mayo -y salad, earthy Jews. And then there's like this like bobbed nose, like like nouveau riche Jew that he's in love with, Brenda. Like I recognize that on like a bones level, you know? And I feel like that just like infested and like kind of milk fed might not exist if I hadn't read that when I was like 11. Yay for books that created us. Yeah. Woo. Hi. Hi. Um, so if it's okay, uh, that's a wrap on our presentation. Uh, thank you so much to our guests and to everyone who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured books. Yes. Just click on the green purchase button that reads Milk Blood Heat directly below the viewer screen. To buy Milk Fed, please click the link provided in the sidebar. We're also accepting donations on our website. If you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, please make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great, great evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, y'all.